All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with the second debate. Thanks for sticking with us through the break if you have. And up next, we have Ashley Yates giving the unbiased introduction. She's from The Ohio State University. Thank you. Um, so today I'll be presenting the unbiased introduction for the student debate topic. With the development of tools like RNAi, in the future we may be capable of eradicating species. If we can eradicate a species, should we? According to a previous Entomological Society of America debate, eradication is defined as the removal of all individuals of a species from an area where it is unlikely to be reintroduced. And eradication programs are employed to combat insects or pathogens that threaten the well-being of humans, animals, and or agriculture. The targets of these programs are often an invasive species. And alternatives to eradication include continual management using biological control, slowing the invasion rates of invasive species, and area-wide suppression, which reduces the density of a pest over a large area. There are many considerations that determine whether erad eradication should be attempted at a global scale. These include establishing the threat of the pest. A pest may threaten ecology, trade restrictions, agriculture, or human health. Additionally, cost-benefit analyses are conducted in order to compare the monetary costs of a continual management program versus eradication. It should also be determined whether eradication within an area will create a conflict of interest. So if the eradication will be beneficial to one group, but harmful to another. And finally, another um, major contributing factor is the likelihood of successful eradication. So for example, a recently introduced species has a much higher chance of being eradicated from a certain area. There have been many attempted eradication programs in the United States. Some have been successful and some have been unsuccessful. Examples of successful eradication include the eradication of the screw worm from the southeastern US during the 1960s, and eradication of the cattle tick from the southern US from the early 1900s to about 1960s. Eradication programs that are unsuccessful do not fully achieve complete elimination of the target species. And the goals of these programs often shift to alternative methods for pest management. And examples of these include eradication of the gypsy moth from the north, northeastern US during the late 1800s and of the imported fire ant during the 1950s. Commonly used techniques in these programs include the use of sterile insects, mating disruption, insecticides, and the manual removal of hosts. However, emerging technologies and pest control may be capable of global eradication of a species. These new technologies are targeting insect genes, and they can enhance species specificity and reduce the impact on non-target organisms. One example of such a technology is RNA interference, or R RNAi. This is a process in which double-stranded RNA is introduced into an organism and causes suppression of a target gene. An RNAi can be used to kill insects if the gene targeted for suppression is essential for the insect's survival. The potential of species eradication will require the following considerations to be conducted on a global scale instead of just on a local scale. These include establishing the threat of the pest, conducting the cost-benefit analyses, determining whether there are conflicts of interest, and finding the likelihood of successful eradication. Additionally, this will require the global assessment of the ecological, economic, and societal impacts. And finally, the potential of global, globally eradicating a species presents new questions regarding the ethics of this situation. Thank you. All right, up next we have, giving their introduction, the pro team from Louisiana State University. Good afternoon. We're from LSU and we're here to debate that in some instances, we should eradicate species. Eradication is defined by Miller et al, 2006, as the global and permanent absence of an organism. 
Once eradication is achieved, subsequent control is unnecessary. Elimination is the regional reduction of an organism to zero. Using elimination strategies opens these regions to reintroduction of the species, and it requires ongoing input of resources. Eradication and elimination are often used interchangeably in conversation, but we want to make it clear eradication and elimination are different. We are debating for global and permanent eradication of species. With new technologies like RNAi and CRISPR, eradication is a reality. As S. Velt et al. said in 2014, these technologies allow us to address problems such as insect-borne disease and pesticide resistance. The potential applications are relevant to human health, agriculture, biodiversity, and ecological science. With regards to the safety of these techniques, literature has shown the potential for reversibility, immunization to block spread, and precision targeting. Authors of the literature agree that full transparency with the use of these techniques is needed, but that even still, these technologies are worth pursuing for future use. We have compiled a list of potential eradication candidates. The top tier on this list that you see in front of you have our strongest support for eradication, while lower tiers will require significantly more research. There are no vertebrates on this list, and there are only two invertebrates. This is because we believe eradication candidates must be lower order organisms to decrease the likelihood of ecologically adverse effects. Some of our top tier candidates, like yaws and guinea worm, are already undergoing eradication. These are some species in which eradication may be the most appropriate strategy. There are many potential benefits of eradication. We've grouped them into three main areas, economics, the environment, and ethics. We'll go more into detail in the coming slides, but the summary is that the benefits of eradication can be immense. Some of the benefits include things like improved food security, sustainable agricultural practices, and saving human lives. Organizations like the United Nations will be in support of species eradication. The UN came together 15 years ago and made a list of goals that, if achieved, would better the planet. These goals include reducing world hunger and poverty, combating malaria and other deadly diseases, and encouraging global cooperation. All of these can be improved through eradication of select species. Eradication is cost effective. According to Fenner et al. 1988, smallpox eradication cost the world just over $300 million. The United States alone was spending $350 million every year to vaccinate and manage smallpox. The benefit to cost ratio is immense. Countries in sub-Saharan Africa could recover 1.3% of their GDP if freed from the economic burden of malaria. With the freeing of resources of this magnitude, there would be major benefits to society. Healthy people can go to work and contribute not only to their own financial success, but to the whole community. This freeing of resources can also allow for increased funding to conservation programs, benefiting the environment. Local elimination and continued control, on the other hand, are not cost effective. We spend about $4 billion every year on control of malaria and suffer another $4 billion in crop damage due to the potato late flight. Current practices are never-ending resource dumps. On the other hand, once an eradication program is completed, there is no further drain on resources. Eradication is more environmentally sustainable. These new technologies are highly specific and low risk. More research is needed, but the non-target effects of technology like RNAi could be less damaging than current practices. Chemicals with known environmental and non-target risks like DDT are still used for local control and elimination across the world. Eradication campaigns also can improve biodiversity, especially in developing countries, by protecting multiple species which are plagued by a single disease-causing agent. According to Skerat et al. 2007, there exists an amphibian chytrid fungus which is endangering over 200 species of frogs. While more research is needed, it appears that eradication of this single species can allow for the proliferation of many others, preserving biodiversity. 
Eradication is the ethically superior choice. Eradication provides benefits worldwide, not just regionally, like with current practices. Developing countries are the most adversely affected by the species we are proposing for eradication, and they are often the most neglected and forgotten regions on the planet. This strategy would allow them to rise above their current situation through improved economics, health, education, quality of life. Eradication also encourages international cooperation through involvement of local, regional, and world leaders. Current strategies, including local elimination, favor developed countries, prolong human suffering and incidence of disease, and have undeniably failed in developing nations. Eradication does not play favorites. In conclusion, in some instances, the benefits of eradicating a species far outweigh the costs. Economically, we could save and redistribute vast amounts of resources. Econo environmentally, we can invest in strategies which utilize fewer pesticides and have incredible specificity. And most of all, ethically, it would be unethical not to eradicate some of these candidates. When presented with the opportunity to save human lives, how can we possibly say no? Thank you. North Carolina State, you have three minutes for cross-examination. Thank you. Thank you. So you cite uh, Miller et al. in Control and Eradication, who states that it is an impossibility to prove that the organism is extinct and no longer exists in a field or laboratory environments. How do you propose to prove that the or organism no longer exists in any of these locations? Well, um, in this debate, we're talking more about whether we should eradicate a species or not, not how it's going to be done. Do, are we back and forth? Is yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and you uh, also cite Miller and all, and you claim that eradication campaigns will reduce human suffering, whereas the polio eradication campaign has failed to co-administer measles and other common childhood vaccina vaccinations, which has actually led to a greater increase in child mortality. So how do you justify the benefits of eradication campaigns in cases such as these? I think the benefits of eradicating infectious diseases are very clear. These are already major goals that have been highlighted by world experts, including the United Nations. It's, it's clear that eradication of diseases like malaria are going to have a net benefit on global health. But the benefits realized from malaria eradication is actually malaria control because we haven't eradicated it. Oh, so, okay. <clears throat> um, could you clarify your definition of eradication? Does this include extinction of the species? Yes, it does. Uh, the organizers of the debate indicated that we are talking about global and eradication or extinction of species. However, you can maintain, according to this definition, specimens in a lab, such as, as we've done with smallpox. So if you, if you can maintain specimens, is there a chance of reinvasion? No, and there's no requirement that you would have to maintain laboratory cultures but uh, if quarantines and proper protocols are followed, there will be no risk of reintroduction. So how do you address the nature of potential reservoirs for disease-causing microbes or vectors, as well as different changes in host capabilities, um, which uh, one of your sources, Miller et al., on control eradication, so especially with climate change, which is another one of your sources, Mark Urban, accelerating extinction risk from climate change. So how do you address these issues? Well, uh, as we said, we're targeting the pathogen itself, and while we will have difficulties achieving eradication, this debate is hypothetical, and so we're arguing that we should eradicate species, not that we know exactly now how it's going to be done for every one of these organisms. These are uh, ever advancing technologies, mm -hmm. and so the technology might so, not be available now. But All right, thank you, guys. Way. We're ready for the next introduction. All right, now defending the con side of the debate, we have North Carolina State University. If we can eradicate a species, should we? 
My team is here to tell you why the answer needs to be no. First off, let's start with some definitions. What do we mean by eradication? For the purposes of this debate, and as defined by the debate organizers, eradication is worldwide, not local. In essence, an eradicated species is extinct. Elimination, on the other hand, is the removal of a species from a defined area, but individuals exist elsewhere, either in the lab or in the wild. Eradication should never be attempted. Elimination on a large scale is mostly unjustifiable and should be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We have the tools now to control species. However, the technology itself isn't important. The question here today is about the ethics of eradication, which is independent of any one technology. This is not a new discussion. In fact, this isn't even a new discussion to ESA. In the 70s, a debate took place here about the eradication of plant pests. But here we are 40 years later, and the ethical question of eradication is one that remains unanswered, and people still differ on what accomplishing that goal actually means. And we needn't forget that this debate is more expansive than just pathogens. It's about all species. The elimination of pests and pathogens, or what has been mistakenly termed as eradication, has been attempted many times, but successful ones have been limited in scope. Wolves were eliminated from Yellowstone in the 20s, invasive rats have been removed from islands, and screwworm is no longer found in North America. However, even when you have local elimination, unintended consequences can occur. When wolves were removed from Yellowstone, an ecological cascade followed, negatively affecting um, everything from plants to animals, from willows to songbirds. And some large-scale eliminations have been successful. Smallpox now only exists in a few laboratory freezers. We have the ability to destroy these specimens, but we keep them. Why haven't we eradicated it? We're keeping smallpox alive because we may need it someday if smallpox or something similar resurfaces in order to quickly develop treatments. Additionally, there are many considerations that complicate the case for eradication. Human health issues cannot be removed from their social, political, or cultural context. Political stability is a key component to successful eradications and one of the main reasons why, although it's been a target for decades, Polio has yet to be eradicated. National, international, and corporate priorities are often hidden under the guise of humanitarianism, and so eradication campaigns may end up reinforcing existing inequalities. And though, instead of targeting a single pathogen, we may be better off if the money spent on eradication efforts were focused to, on improving and changing the conditions that allow for rapid disease spread. While geopolitical considerations are important, so are the logistical ones. Proving successful eradication will be extremely difficult. Continued monitoring and screening is, will be costly but necessary to ensure a species doesn't reinvade an ecosystem. Current tools are unfortunately not capable of detecting low-level recurrences. Eliminating insect vectors of disease is not a solution either and would only temporarily alleviate human suffering. The ecological effects would be uncertain and there's no way of knowing if something better or worse would fill the empty niche. Often, the benefits of eradication are exaggerated while the costs are underestimated. The cost of eradicating the last 10% of individuals can cost as much or more than the first 90%. Crop pests and invasive species have been targeted with uncertain consequences. For example, cotton bollworm was a tar target of eradication for decades. BT cotton was developed to control the species. Farmers decreased their insecticide usage, but soon experienced a surge in secondary pests. So although one pest was eliminated, others took its place, and the farmers saw little benefit from adopting this technology. To paraphrase Aldo Leopold, man-made extinctions are on a very different time scale than, um, than evolutionary ones, 
and often have unforeseen consequences. While it is true that many millions of species have gone extinct on this earth, it is hubris to think that we can know with any certainty the effect of removing a species from its ecosystem. Individuals and group groups possess different value systems. What may be a pest in one place could be a valuable resource elsewhere. Which leads me to our final questions. Who decides which species to keep and which to eradicate? Who should decide? Do we even have the right to exercise this power over other species? Decisions like these will have permanent consequences. And so who will inherit the consequences of our actions today? So where does that leave us? Elimination may be attempted in certain circumstances, but the costs of eradication are too high, the benefits are uncertain, and the consequences are unknowable. We should focus on allocating our finite resources carefully, using the powerful tools we have to improve control methods rather than trying to get rid of every single individual. We should aim for comprehensive human health improvements rather than targeting a single species. Eradication is not practical, it is not necessary, and most importantly, it is not ethical. Thank you. All right, you have three minutes for your cross-examination. Uh, you mentioned timber wolves in Yellowstone as having an ecological consequences, but if I look at your reference list, I don't see any papers that have documented ecological consequences of elimination of host-specific pathogens, such as the ones we've suggested. Do you have any references that have documented this? I think we both cited the um, Fang et al. paper, in which we don't have a, are you talking about mosquitoes, potentially? I'm talking about host-specific pathogens, such as malaria, plasmodium, and uh, plant pathogens, such as potato blight. Most, most pathogens do not have a single host species. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess most of the approaches would be to eliminate the vector. Yes. And Specifically, I asked if you had any references yeah. that have ever documented this having a negative ecological impact. Our Weinstein 2011 reference talks about the correlation in the rise of HIV following the eradication of smallpox, which is probably the most specific pathogen that has been eradicated. Um, there is a, yeah, so Weinstein 2011. Hey, you said that um, eradication should never, under any circumstances, be attempted, but even if we have evidence stating that there are not going to be adverse ecological effects and that it is more economic, you maintain that stance? Yes, we maintain the stance by our definition of eradication, um, which would be you maintain laboratory stocks. They may have a potential future value, and we also might not know some of the stocks or where it might be in wild populations. So yes, we maintain that definition. You mentioned cost is all underestimated for eradication program. Do you think a cost or cost beneficial ratio is a good measurement for the program? There are many problems with cost benefit ratios uh, calculations, and they don't incorporate a lot of key factors, especially social and cultural ones. And even economic um, standards are not always included in those, those ratios. So it's not a good indicator of whether or not you should eradicate or control a species. Can you clarify how you will uh, deal with these attempted consequences of using elimination? I'm sorry, could you repeat Can you, you clarify how you will attempt it? I mean, how will you deal with the intended consequences of using elimination? Do you have a references that says uh, elimination is the uh, best option instead of eradication? We maintain that elimination should be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis. It is not always the best option. And as, as for sources, I think that most of the papers that we've both cited, we are talking about control or elimination attempts and not eradication because they have not been realized yet. All right, thank you to both teams. We're going to begin our period of three-minute rebuttals. You can obviously ask the other team questions, but they won't be able to answer until their rebuttal period begins. And we're starting with North Carolina State. Okay. 
So with the new technologies we have, like RNAi, um, we can specifically, you claim that we can specifically target pest species and minimize off-target effects. So even if we have the ability to minimize off-target effects and specifically target pest species, we still don't know the consequences of removing certain pest species, what the removing certain pest species will be. We should use uh, these technologies for controlling pests rather than for eradicating them. So you cite a paper on um, the Raoul and Rue in the body loss as a vector of re-emerging diseases. However, one of the main conclusions in this paper is that lice can transmit any agent of chronic bacterium, and the lice are also capable mechanical transmitters. So can you explain how using these species-specific technologies to eradicate a louse would lead to a disease eradication? In many of your papers um, cite that the cost of control is always going to be less than the cost of um, eradication, and also that the benefits of eradication are minimal compared to uh, the cost of control because most of the benefits of control are, have been realized. And so adding to eradication would not benefit very much due to, is, despite the extra cost. Um, in the in the Googler paper, an epidemic dengue, the um, conclusion is that controlling Aedes aegypti could be effectively prevented if countries had the resources and the political will to develop and implement these community-based prevention and control programs. So this really suggests that the most effective approach to get rid of dengue would be a control program, a community-based one, and not one that aims at eradication. Um, you also make the uh, claim that the economic burden of eradication is less than that of elimination. Uh, making this assumption ignores the extreme cost of surveillance and post-eradication efforts that would be needed. Kaplan in 2009 says, chasing down the last cases is very costly. Government budgets and resources in poor nations are diverted from other far more pressing local problems uh, to try and capture the least marginal cases. Also from Wilson 2014, um, they say the standard cost effect effectiveness tools struggle to accurately account for the benefits of ordinary national vaccination campaigns. And accounting for the benefits of eradication campaigns is significantly more difficult um, than we typically give credit. And you say that you want to target the pathogen itself. Why wouldn't you want to target the disease that is affecting humans? All right, LSU, you may rebut. Okay, so economically, it is more economic to utilize eradication in, in smallpox. The control of smallpox was like $3 million, whereas the eradication was $350 million. And that was $3 million that was being used and spent every single year. So it has been massively beneficial to eradicate smallpox. Our cost-benefit ratio, even though you don't like utilizing that, is like 483 to 1. So it's been massively economic to eradicate that virus. Also, eradication of the guinea worm would be um, estimated at 225 million. Eradication of yaws is also around 300 million, whereas just controlling for malaria is $4 billion a year. So I think with these numbers, it's easy to see that it's much more economic to eradicate a species and not continually put funds and resources into this endless dump of elimination that will never end. And you mentioned about the benefits of eradication, well, um, for guinea worm, we've only um, begun to eliminate it. So far, it has not been eradicated, but we're already seeing that we have improved water quality, it's created jobs, promoted women's clubs, awareness of health, school and absenteeism has decreased, and agricultural productivity has improved. So these are the benefits of only beginning to eliminate. And with eradication, these, are, these benefits will be further realized, and we will have more resources available to put into education, infrastructure, conservation even. So rather than uh, focusing on the elimination or eradic I'm sorry, the eradication of one species, we can think about how we can be conserving more of our biodiversity. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, once a species is eradicated, those cost-benefit ratios continue to increase every year that you don't have to spend more money controlling these organisms. So these are not uh, one-time benefits. These uh, continue to save resources and continue to increase the cost-benefit ratios with each year that a species remains eradicated. 
along the same lines, you mentioned that the benefits of control have been realized, and that's true for, let's say, malaria in the United States, where you're talking about local elimination, but that's utterly failed in places across the globe, say in Africa and Asia, where control has not been realized, whereas eradication campaigns will provide a global front to prevent that from reemerging. And we think the ethical arguments are very clear. It's, it's uh, not being selfish or anthropocentric. It's being altruistic to save human lives. There's hundreds of millions of people that are currently suffering from horrible diseases and causing high child mortality in the parts of the world that, that need help the most. They're not getting in. These eradication programs we're proposing would have vast, far-reaching benefits across the globe. All right, you may begin your second rebuttal period. You mentioned the guinea worm and nonchocoriasis uh, eradication efforts. However, these have been going on for decades. We, uh, do you believe that we should have a time limit for eradication campaigns? Otherwise, they should just be considered continual control of our elimination efforts. Um, um, in addition, uh, in the in your source, Bailey et al., 2015, you're talking about the ethical arguments and their concerns with uh, the eradication of lymphatic filariasis and onchocoriasis, that there are affronts to agency association and respect. So how do you ensure that those are not occurring? And there's more um, pressure with an eradication effort compared to a control effort. So these are a bigger concern with his coercion measures for eradication and control. Also, could you talk about who um, gets to decide what species should be eradicated? Uh, there's evidence that uh, many uh, developing, you mentioned that developing nations would benefit the greatest, and there's evidence that people who um, live in developing nations would prefer that money to be spent on diseases that affect a larger number of people than the fewer number of people who are defected by, affected by these very specific and um, low occurring uh, pathogens that, like onchocoriasis and um, the other ones that you mentioned. And the benefits of eradication that you mentioned, those aren't direct benefits. Those are, trans they're not necessarily would follow with the eradication of a single pathogen. Why wouldn't you want to focus on overall health improvement rather than targeting a single disease, which when it was eliminated, it might not even make a big difference in the lives of those people. Um, this debate is about the extinction of all species, not just a few pathogens. So if you're allowing one species to go extinct, you're allowing them all to have that option. So who gets to decide these questions, you know? Also, oftentimes, uh, cost-benefit analysis doesn't consider the ongoing surveillance costs um, that are required to ensure that the species is extinct, and also you can't prove a negative, so um, it, uh, it's impossible to prove that a species is extinct. In the tail end of the guinea worm, the berry reference, um, you have a claim you claim that eradication programs could bring stability to a country, but it's been uh, documented that eradication frequently fails without political stability already in the location, especially when you get to the end of an eradication program, such as with Guinea worm. All right, we'll begin our final rebuttal period. Uh, to make it clear, we're talking about eliminating some of the most deadly diseases across the world. And that is going to be a huge net benefit to health care and general well-being in general. Once you get rid of a, a plasmodium like malaria, mm -hmm. you'll have enormous resources freed up to help treat other conditions. It's, it's not just that eliminating this one species is treating one problem. It's cascading, uh, eradicating a species. It's cascading effects that will come once you free up all those resources and all that uh, available effort and labor to treat different diseases will now be diverted away from malaria and can be used to treat any other diseases and improve general health care. 
With these new technologies, they're so highly specific that they can target not just a species, but even a specific subpopulation of a species. So we're pretty, we're very certain with our t um, resources like SVELT that these technologies are going to be safe to use because he can reverse them. There is reversibility that's possible. There can be immunization, so gene drives that are in place can be immunized against. So a lot of these unknown effects, I mean, it's just an illusion that, oh, something might go wrong. That's not enough of a reason not to address the situation that there are a million children dying each year from malaria alone. And as for locals, we have some references that state that it's very important to have global transparency and to have locals on board. So everyone from your local community level up to the leaders at the UN need to work together on this and make sure that everyone is in favor of the situation. Coercion should never be utilized as a tactic. And also, I think we can see that the benefits, some of them are very direct. Kids who don't have malaria go to school and have better educations, better job opportunities in their future, improved social lives. I mean, the overall quality of life of people who no longer are under the pressure of these pathogens is immense. And opening up eradication for these couple of species that we're talking about does not mean that you can eradicate any species. There must be, the right research needs to be done. We need to make sure that in each situation it is absolutely the most economic thing to do. It is going to be the most ethical thing to do when you consider the morbidity and mortality that are caused by these diseases. And you mentioned uh, cost of ongoing surveillance. That's a drawback of elimination, not eradication. There's no ongoing surveillance for smallpox. So those cost benefit, those costs are associated with your proposed strategy not with eradication. Right, in our answer rank reference, we have a quote that he says, eradication by definition means the disease is gone from the entire planet. It's only in a lab if you, if you even want it to be. So there's no chance for reoccurrence. But there does remain a chance for reintroductions with elimination. There are also major drawbacks to elimination such as pesticides and resistance. All right, thank you to both teams. Um, we're now gonna begin our 10 minute question session. For those who are coming to us new and didn't see the first debate, we're gonna have the judges go first. Any remaining time, the audiences can line up at the mic and ask questions. Yeah, I have a question for LSU team. What are the major uh, technical hurdles in implementing er eradication of a particular species? For example, uh, you counted uh, several benefits of, you know, if we eradicate malaria from this world. So uh, just in this case, what do you think? Uh, what are technical difficulties uh, for eradicating, for example, malaria? We actually didn't focus um, that much on the technical diff difficulties with the methods because the debate is if we can, should we, not how are we going to? Yes, there's, there's certainly going to be challenges with any large-scale eradication program, but the new technologies that are emerging are, are making things that in the past seemed impossible uh, very much realities now. And we think as this technology moves forward, those technical difficulties are going to be uh, more and more achievable to overcome. Also, we have some techniques can successfully eradicate this species in a local area. This is a good start for the global eradication. So that is feasible. I would like to ask both teams, what would be your recommendation as to how to make such a decision about eradication or not eradication? What recommendation for how would such a question be discussed um, in, in the public and by decision makers? Well, uh, we, we cite the, the, UN, uh, the UN Millennial Goals, and these were a group of world experts from countries represented all over the world that came together and decided that malaria eradication is a goal that will benefit the entire world. And so these type of international cooperations can really uh, not only bring people together, but result in a better decision-making progress that benefits the entire world. So it's a really difficult uh, question to answer. I think oftentimes the way control programs go, it, it's a top-down control. It's oftentimes hard to get communities engaged, and oftentimes communities' priorities are different than the disease that we're trying to eradicate. 
So it's a really complex question. And even if some strategies are aimed more at community-based approaches, we are not there yet, even though that may be ideal. But it's hard to have governments with top-down control telling local communities, well, this is what we want you to focus on. And they might have other priorities. It's really complex. That would be ideal. <laughs> So definitely considering non-target effects, the economics behind it, and the overall benefits to the people who will be who will be receiving the benefits from the eradication of the species. Yeah, and we think that all people should be involved in these decisions and not just high-level government officials and the elite and you know the edu Westerners. We think all groups of people who will be affected need to be um, have their autonomy in this decision-making process. Yeah. Especially, Every, oh, go ahead. Everybody has different opinions and value systems, and so how are you going to get global approval? I mean, that's just, it. if you can get it, like, how would you know, you know? You need to get a sign-off on every single person, so it's not possible. Locals absolutely need to be involved in the decision. That's why one of our main references is let the locals lead, because if that's your community where you're living, you should have the biggest voice in these decisions. If they're okay. not in favor of it. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next question just so we can make sure we get some more in there. Are there any other judges with questions? Or we can move on to the audience. So we got one more. Um, so oftentimes, these pathogens that you're trying to get rid of don't just have one species that transmits it. There's one main, but there's oftentimes several species that transmit it. So do you expect that one of those other secondary species would just move into that niche and then become the primary vector? Right. So if you're thinking about maybe like Aedes aegypti, which vectors multiple diseases, and Aedes albopictus is then also a competent vector of some of the same diseases, Aedes albopictus is never going to be as good as Aedes aegypti. So it would definitely, if not completely resolve the issue, the incidence of disease would be massively decreased and there would still be an overall net benefit. You could also um, have that overall decrease in disease by just eliminating Aedes aegypti rather than taking the risk that something better or worse would fill the niche by completely eradicating it. Huh. And there's also, um, if you wanted to target a pathogen, in the case of Aedes aegypti, which vectors dengue primarily, there are four, maybe now even five different serotypes of virus. That's also another really big hurdle and difficulty. The technology is not there yet. Same with the malaria. And just to clarify, these risks are already being taken with elimination. If, if you're eliminating an organism from an environment, that niche is still open for it to be filled with another organism. So that's, that's a risk associated with both eradication and with elimination. Any more questions from our judges? Right, we're going to go ahead and open the floor for audience questions. And I see you've been already ready to go online. Go ahead. Even if we were to eradicate lower trophic organisms, such as disease-causing microbes, wouldn't this exacerbate other problems? For example, eradicating a disease within humans, such as malaria, um, if millions are dying from malaria and we save them, then there are millions we need to feed, educate, house, clothe, and otherwise take care of. Are those costs considered in the cost of eradication? And I'm going to assume that's directed this way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, uh, I don't think anyone w uh, will, can ethically argue that a way to control human population growth is through increased mortality from infectious disease. And we think that the benefits that are achieved from eradication of a disease like malaria will be increased education, which will translate very clearly into population growth rates. That's why the countries with poor infrastructure are currently experiencing the highest growth rates. The benefits that come from eradication of malaria will result in better infrastructure and uh, better institutions that can help reduce uh, population growth rate the right way without increasing human mortality. I guess I mean... S sorry, I want to make sure we don't have anybody uh, else before you do a follow-up. Do we have anybody else in the audience that would like to ask a question? All right, go ahead. I guess I mean, if the human population was, is, was increased, wouldn't this exacerbate global resources, especially in light of the global food crisis? Uh, well, yes, the human population is increasing, and uh, child mortality is, uh, would be dramatically decreased. But I think 
by improving infrastructure, you can curb the increase of human populations more than if you did nothing. We think there would be a net benefit across the low globe that will help bring some of these struggling nations to a place where they can institute uh, a, a more sustainable population growth rate in the future. Right. And when people are not suffering from things like malaria or lymphatic filariasis and they can go to school, become educated, they can acquire better jobs, improve their economy, not just in their rural areas, but for the whole community or country. And by improved economics, a lot of these problems that you're talking about will be resol resolved. Are those costs considered in the cost of eradication? Uh, they are considered benefits, <coughs> not costs. All right, anybody else from the audience with questions? I'm sure a few of our judges would probably like to go to break a little bit early. All right, well, thank you so much for watching the second debate.